Welcome everyone again to this session. Uh, this is about visual validation, the missing tip of the automation pyramid. Not as much as a tongue twister uh, if you slow it down, but uh, yes, it can get interesting. Quick introduction about myself. I'm Anand Bagmar. I've been in the quality space uh, for more than 20 years now. I've worked with various product and services organizations over this uh, time uh, across uh, various different countries and had great mentors, colleagues, friends, whom I learned a lot from, and also many whom I learned a lot of things that I should not be doing in uh, when it comes to my opportunity. But that's enough about me. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter, and we can definitely have more follow-up conversations beyond this Agile India virtual conference as well. So let's start off. And uh, I would really like uh, you to try and participate in this and put in uh, your thoughts. I'm going to be asking a few questions. Put in your thoughts in the discuss uh, uh, section of your browser window over there. That would help us make this a little bit more interactive than just me rambling on. So let's start off with an activity, right? How do you test an uh, ink pen? Okay, so can you probably just you know, write on what are the few top things that come to your mind in the discuss section. Okay, trying to write with it. Uh, uh, yes, that's right. Anything else? Okay, uh, I'll give you some answers uh, that uh, come up first when it, you take a pen in hand and you try to test it, right? So of course, it has to write properly. Uh, yes, there's another thing, fill the uh, empty ink tank. And that is you're assuming that there's an ink tank set over there, right? Uh, you don't know what type or how are you going to really fill the ink over there? But yes, uh, that is also very important. You would also see if the cap closes properly. It looks as expected. And of course, it is visually appealing as well. You can hold the pen properly while writing. And there are so many other type of scenarios, test cases that you can come up with uh, for this uh, testing a pen. But the challenge is if you wait for the pen to come in your hand for testing, it is too late. And why? Because the pen is made up of many different components. It could have a cartridge or it could have an ink tank, the way Sid mentioned as one of his thoughts around it. So there could be different mechanisms of how you're going to uh, fill ink in the pen for it uh, to uh, be able to write with it. Also, there are various different components. The nib, uh, does it fit correctly or not? Is it of the right shape, the right thickness? Is it smooth enough? Uh, do all those different smaller pieces fit in well together with each other before the final assembly can happen for the pen? And that's how you typically build a pen and uh, how you would end up testing it eventually. But if you miss out on any of these earlier validations in place, what if that ink cartridge does not fit correctly into the pen or it is loose? When you shake the pen, that cartridge comes loose. The pen is of no use in that case. In fact, your clothes might get spoiled or wherever you're keeping the pen, that might get spoiled. Uh, it's of no use to anyone, right? So you really have to think about how are you going to build the quality inside out, get those components tested correctly before they integrate with the bigger, larger pieces and eventually make it a pen. And not surprisingly, this applies to software as well. You look at a website or a native app, it seems like a simple enough product, a simple enough uh, you know, interactions that you are trying to do. But in the back end, it could be a really complicated architecture that is really enabling that kind of functionality for you, for whoever that end user is. So you have to think about how is your product really built inside out, and based on that, how can you test early to get that feedback? Now, what is really missing in this case? Right? Let's look at that. How do you ensure what was working before continues to work well now. And this is definitely a more applicable in software type products, not like a pen, where the architecture of a pen is not really going to evolve for the same pen that you'll create different types of pen, but it's not the same pen. But from software perspective, we release a product at whatever point in time, and then you incrementally make changes to that product to add more functionality or fix issues based on feedback that you have got. How do you make sure that what was working well earlier continues to work well after these changes are done as well? And that is a big question that you need to really get a handle on because it's not just about how am I testing the changes correctly, it's about making sure the overall product is also working well. 
So if you think about a typical testing approach, right, and I'm not going to preach to the choir over here, we are in Agile India, Agile has been around for a long time. The XP practices have been around for a long time. We've heard about these uh, on far too many occasions. But we know that test automation is one of the key enablers to get that early feedback and make sure we keep validating the existing behavior uh, with what was expected uh, as the product changes. And with the uh, automation, uh, we of course need to think about the pyramid. What are the different types of tests that you can automate to get that feedback earlier? And you think about it from a technology facing perspective or business facing perspective, you have to think based on uh, what kind of feedback are you really getting, right? If it's a slow feedback, how can you restructure your test you know, to get that feedback faster? And a part of uh, all these automated tests, you also need to have a good strategy for doing exploratory testing with for tests that have not been automated, cannot be automated or certain things that you understand from a human context perspective of interacting with the product. So the pyramid actually can get broken further based on the context of the product as well, right? There are uh, tests that you can automate from NFR perspective, for example, performance, security, accessibility, analytics. These are all very important types of tests, including many others. Again, the types of tests that you would automate depends on the context of your product. But all of these tests are again, very, very important when it comes to building a quality feedback for your product. That said, there is a challenge that is there, right? And that challenge is mostly about how are we addressing and approaching the non-automated test for your product. And typically the approach taken by the team, whoever the team is, uh, usually or uh, mostly it is QAs in uh, various, uh, in more, most project teams, but you take an approach of finding or uh, thinking about this as spot the difference, right? How am I really going to do exploratory testing? Yes, I'm going to explore, but there has to be some aspect of thinking, why is this exploration results correct or incorrect, right? And one of the approaches over there, which unfortunately uh, comes up with is spot the differences. Okay, I'm going to back off a little bit from where I was in interest of time and just get started with it uh, again. Again, apologies for the technical glitch. This is definitely on my side, as I mentioned, internet issues and no power as well. So let's see if we can get to the next 30 minutes uh, without any interruption from the network perspective now. So we were speaking about uh, the automation pyramid. We now uh, we know what the value it brings uh, and how we can help look at, get quick feedback of the overall quality of the product based on these automated tests. But there's still a big ch uh, challenge that remains and that is in terms of the manual and exploratory testing that is happening. And for that, uh, one of the techniques usually subconsciously that uh, QAs uh, end up doing is uh, almost like playing the game of spot the difference. So if I show you this particular image and ask you how many differences do you see over there, given a little time, you'll be able to come up with the number of differences and where exactly those differences are. But if I tell you this quickly and say, okay, you know, tell me immediately right now how many differences are there, you may find a couple of them, maybe not as well, right? But in this particular image, there are four differences that is there. Let's take another example. If I give you this particular comparison, what are the differences in these two you know, images that are seen? And how quickly can you come up with the 10 differences that are there over here, right? Maybe half a minute, a minute or so. But I lied, there are not really 10 differences. Again, there are just a few differences over here. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this, uh, sharing this point is a lot of approach to doing manual testing or exploratory testing is unfortunately just looking at the product and given the context of the product from your uh, past experiences, you would see if it is working correctly or not. And what happens is many a times is, uh, which is not a surprise, right? This happens in software as well. It's not just about looking at an image and seeing what is going on. You will see countless such examples in the field, whether it is Twitter, where the tweets are misaligned, or UPS, where uh, the, on the tablet version of the app, the product does not show up correctly. And for those who spotted it, there are two lines also over here on the screen in the title, right? So these are differences that you may or may not realize very quickly, given the context of how you're testing, what uh, pressure you're working under, or what timeline you're working under. So again, uh, many examples, Financial Times, the title being too long, and it overlaps into the content itself. Here's Amazon uh, web page from uh, the past and uh, 
a big sale launch, which is going to happen in India soon in a couple of days now. And instead of the numbers growing, they saw the numbers actually dipping in uh, instead, right? So you look at the product and realize, oh, shoot, there's something basic that is missing that we could have found out. Also, another example of HDFC Bank, where on the homepage itself, we are seeing this kind of weird overlapped uh, content, right? So the challenge over here is that the defects escape because of our approach to testing is incorrect. We are focused on a very raw ad hoc way of testing at the top layer of the pyramid. And that is the challenge that we are trying to solve. And that is a challenge that I'm trying to discuss with you with the solution, how you can look at the UX of visual testing, which is a missing piece in the overall aspect of quality that you are focused on. Okay. Yes, uh, 10 was a misleading uh, number, but uh, you're right, Sakshi, in that aspect. So now let's look at what happens when visual testing is not done. We've already seen certain examples that I shared earlier, right? UPS or uh, Amazon, certain products, they have... Uh, there's not a revenue loss in that sense, right? So Financial Times, the example that I showed you, what would happen if that text uh, title is overlapping? It's fine. I'll still click on that article and I'll be able to see the content completely. Or well, nothing is going to, uh, the world is not going to end if I'm not able to read that few lines of text over there. Same for Twitter as well, right? But in case of UPS or Amazon, there's actually a revenue loss that would happen as a result. And that is a challenge which comes across if visual testing is not done as part of your overall testing or quality strategy, you, know, you might end up with business or revenue loss. There is a loss of brand and credibility. And a more, a more or equally important, you start losing your users because users have a very short attention span. right? So it is extremely important to think about how you can make sure the visual aspects of your product are also working correctly. Let's quickly understand for those who are not aware of this, what exactly is visual testing? So visual testing is a way you can validate the visual aspects of the screen, right? The name itself is quite indicative in that sense. You make sure that what is expected or rather what is presented on the screen is matching to what is expected in terms of the layout, the appearance, the content, and the overall UI or the user experience itself, right? That is visual testing. Now, how is visual testing typically done? This is done manually. We saw that example, right? We are manually trying to figure out if there's something wrong with this. And uh, the reason this becomes a challenge is because of it being done manually. It is a very tedious process. It is extremely error prone and it is impossible to scale and repeat. And if it is any of these uh, conditions satisfies in your approach of testing, then you are going to be a blocker for enabling CI CD. Okay. And that's the part that we really need to focus on. How can we uh, avoid, right? How can we remove the blockers and enable the team to move forward faster? So you can use functional automation to help in certain ways, but there are still challenges of how much functional automation can help in this case, right? So over here, this is where I would like to present to you how a visual test automation can work to solve this problem, okay? So the first thing that visual automation needs to do is create baselines. And that is typically done by taking screenshots of the expected UI. When you have created these baselines, you would compare the screenshots when the test runs the next time with the baselines and see if there is a match or not. This can be done at a whole page level or snippet of a page level. Now the whole page itself can be what is seen on your screen versus you scroll and take a full page screenshot and compare against that as well. That is also a, a further level of detail about what type of validation can be done. When you do the comparison, you would find out if there are any differences reported in this, either that is because your product has evolved, that means functionality has changed, so you need to update your baselines, or you've actually found a defect of, uh, which is going to uh, be a problem and you need to fix quickly. That defect could be just a visual defect because there is overlapping text, or it could be a functional defect, which means that, oh, I expected certain values to be seen over there, a certain data to be seen over there, but it is not there. And we'll see more details of this in a demo as well. Okay. Now, the challenges of visual uh, testing is the false positives and negatives. 
And this is extremely important to understand. Uh, basically, it comes down to how the visual test automation itself is being done. If you're going to use pixel comparison for uh, comparing your UI, that is going to be a big problem because browser version changes can create uh, updates in the rendering engine, which means the way pixels are rendered for the same page could be different. Hence, you will get differences over there. Or dynamic data becomes a problem. Or uh, also the responsive web design, right? Or even if you have native apps across all different types of devices, we've got devices right from 4x inches to six and a half, seven inch screens or tablets as well. How many such baselines will you take for each of these specific viewport sizes to do the actual pixel to pixel comparison and make sure everything is fine? So the false positives and negatives is one of the biggest reasons why visual validation uh, fails, automated visual validation fails. The second aspect, which is a challenge, is how do you really create a baseline and maintain these baselines? And again, as I mentioned, this could be for different browsers and devices and resolutions and viewports as well, right? You need to have a baseline for each of these combinations. Otherwise, I'm trying to compare an apple with an orange. And just because both of them are fruit does not mean they are represented the same on the screen, right? So you need to have, do an apple to apple comparison in order to get results from a visual, a visual validation. And that result analysis itself has to be rock solid and uh, give you the correct results. No false positives, no false negatives over there. Only then can you really take action on that. Okay. So this is what is really important uh, from uh, these are the challenges from an automated visual validation perspective. So I hope this resonates uh, with you in terms of uh, what is the problem statement I'm trying to highlight over here for you. A quick thumbs up if you're still with me. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. So how can we really solve this problem in a better way? Okay. And this is where I want to uh, talk about one of the options, what you could use, which fits in very well with your agile uh, way of working, where agile or not for that matter, right? It's a matter of getting quick feedback and uh, accurate feedback about what exactly is happening with your product. And that's where I would like to you know, show a quick demo of one of these tools, uh, Apply Tools, which is a visual AI tool and how it can solve the problem. Again, there are a lot of other tools as well. This is the tool that I'm using from a demo perspective for you. What I have over here is on the screen, hopefully my browser is uh, visible, where I have integrated Apply Tools with my functional testing tool. Now in my functional testing, I could have, uh, you can see from this page, uh, there are more than 40, 50 different SDKs based on the choice of your functional automation tool. You could choose a particular SDK of Apply Tools to integrate visual testing along with your functional testing. And the uh, advantage it brings out is you are using your functional testing tool like Selenium or APM, for example, to drive your application under test to do the various different functionalities. You open the app, you log in, you navigate to different screens, you interact with the screens, uh, do actions on them, right? And that validation is happening from a functional perspective if your workflow is going through correctly. But what those tests do not do for you is, is the screen seen correctly on uh, uh, the device itself? Remember that Amazon example, right? I'm pretty sure uh, the Amazon team ran all the tests possible uh, on the page before doing a release. And the test passed because Selenium is going to pass saying that, okay, I'm still able to click on a particular element or find those elements over there on the browser. But Selenium will not tell you if uh, there is a CSS that is broken, which is causing that weird rendering issue where users cannot even use the product at all, right? So that's where you can really integrate visual testing along with functional testing, where you use a functional testing to drive your application under test to simulate the end user scenarios. And then you will use the visual testing aspects at relevant points. Whenever you say, I want to do a visual validation done of this functionality, the results will be captured, uh, the data will be captured, sent to Apply Tools where the comparison happens. So let's take a quick example. And here's an example of a cross browser test where we are comparing uh, the baseline, which is on the left hand side. We're comparing uh, the screenshot, which was captured as a checkpoint on the right with that baseline. This is running on uh, the baseline was captured on Chrome. The screenshot that was captured as part of the test execution was on Internet Explorer. 
Now, if I use a pixel matching algorithm to do this validation, and if I highlight the differences, you will notice that the whole screen is being shown in pink over here. And that is a big problem. This is a problem of uh, pixel-based validation. In this case, of course, it's going to have the whole page different because it's one browser versus the other. But you will see certain types of false positives even between uh, uh, browser versions at times, depending on what has really changed in that browser. So this is a reason why pixel matching never works. However, if you look at a AI algorithm called the strict algorithm in this case, you will notice that all the region in pink over here that is highlighted is actually the differences that the human can see. The strict algorithm is uh, show me the differences what a human can see as differences, right? And as I switch between the baseline and the checkpoint, you will notice that all the differences highlighted in pink are actually what the human eye can see. Now, again, in this particular case, this is not a good example because uh, you're comparing one browser with the other. And the strict algorithm also is not a good algorithm in this case. So uh, if I use a layout algorithm, in the layout algorithm, uh, you will notice that all the pink has gone off, but there is a uh, dif uh, difference highlighted, which is on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. And that is a defect caused, uh, captured by the layout algorithm. This is actually a functional defect and a visual defect in that sense, right? So because this particular uh, uh, text is missing here, the user will not be able to use this functionality. If I have a Jira integration, I can just create a defect over here, report it in Jira, mark the test has failed, and I can move on with my next execution. The similar approach will work with uh, your uh, native apps as well. This is a dynamic data app, Yahoo Finance app, where the data is different. And you see that again over here, the strict algorithm has captured everything that is different. Now, there are techniques that you can use over here to say, I, want, I don't have control over this section of the page where the data is dynamic. So I want to use a different algorithm for that screen. And I'm using layout over here. So layout is ignore the content, focus on the structure of the page. And based on that, it is still found there is some one difference that is there in the button over here, uh, which is a problem from a layout algorithm perspective. Right? So uh, again, these are some of the examples of the power of AI algorithms that you can get to use uh, to see if your functionality as well as visual aspect user experience is working correctly. And this will work regardless whether it is web apps, native, or even PDF forms for that matter. Uh, for teams which are uh, from a compliance perspective, it is very important to make sure the PDF documents are also validated. And the same algorithms will work for PDF as well. There are now use cases that uh, it will support from a localization perspective. For example, I'm checking a, a login page for Facebook in different languages. And because I'm using a layout algorithm, it is saying the structure of the page is uh, valid. Uh, there's no problem. If I change it to a strict algorithm, uh, you see that all these differences are shown. Now, the other a very important aspect from this is uh, what is important from a scaling your test perspective, right? The users are not just on one browser or one device. You want to scale that execution across all the different browsers and viewport sizes. But there is really not enough value in running your functional tests against all the different browsers or viewport sizes as well. So you could uh, use another feature from Apply Tools called Fast Grid, where you run the test only on one browser, but you configure it to say, I want to do the rendering on all the different browsers as well uh, and viewport sizes. So just by two tests executed, uh, the visual validation is done for all the different browsers and viewport sizes that you have uh, specified, and you get the value from that immediately. Right? So your feedback cycle reduces drastically. You're running the test just once in your CI machine or on your dev or QA laptop itself, and you will be able to get visual validation results uh, for all the different browsers that uh, are important to you. There are other interesting aspects, again, from a shift left perspective, which is very important, is a root cause analysis. Now, what this does is if you click on any of the differences highlighted, Applitools will tell you what is the difference in the DOM and CSS which has caused this difference to come up in the first place. Now, this again becomes a very powerful way to I have not just run my tests in CI. The test will fail if there is a functional defect or a visual defect in CI. So you get that feedback over there. But it's not just important to find what has failed. It's also very important to know why it has failed and take corrective action against it. And these are some of the features uh, from Apply Tools that will help you find those, uh, get that quick feedback and fix the issue as quickly as you uh, can, right? I don't want to get into other features over here, but I hope uh, this aspect uh, you're able to 
relate to in terms of the kind of problems you need to uh, you'll be able to solve over here okay so moving on from the demo itself and we'll uh, take the questions i see there are some questions over here already uh, so it's good uh, we'll get to those uh, shortly i'm almost uh, done i want to have as much uh, q and a as possible and interaction with you as possible on this so the test automation pyramid we already saw right so basically what we are saying is we need to add a visual component to this pyramid and that visual component basically is user experience validation and that has to be automated and remember uh, what i showed as a demo right the validation is automated but taking a decision on that validation is still a human aspect required you as a team member know if the difference that is seen is that because of a regression caught in your product or that is because of your product has evolved and uh, you need to take a decision uh, you need to update your baselines based on that right so it's very important to understand where the value of tools can come into picture it's not about ai solves all the problem ai in this case when used for visual testing is able to tell you the difference with accuracy but you as a team member know why that difference has come in and how you need to address that right so tools have to be used in the correct fashion in order for you to get that feed and overall this is what the product quality is it's not just about ui testing it's not just about unit testing it's all aspects of testing that is done including the non automated testing that all comes together to understand is my product of good quality or not and you have to look at all the results of these tests or other the results of all of these tests talk to all the different team members who have collaborated to uh, implement these tests and um, get the results together you have to uh, take a decision about what is the quality of my product remember we always say quality is a team responsibility how do you enable that it's just a big word this is a way that you can start enabling that you have to ask your development team how is your code quality what is the tech debt over there uh, what is your branch coverage that you have from your uh, unit test coverage before you get to your web service test and so on and so on right together all of these results combined will tell you the value of your automation that will help you make your pyramid really like a pyramid instead of ice cream cone you know, which is you know, unfortunately the case in many many organizations right so in summary what does this really mean right uh, so you need to think about a holistic quality strategy for your product don't think about it i am a qa or i am a estet and this is my scope of influence this is what i am going to be doing or i am a developer this is what how i am going to do tdd or whatever uh, implementation uh, that i am doing and then i'm going to throw it over the wall to some other uh, role who will do whatever else is required no have a holistic quality strategy for your product its product actually not produce ha uh -huh. uh, interesting uh, defect i found there uh you need to think about how can you shift left to get quick feedback and shift left can happen at various different levels you have to get all the different roles involved over there to make sure that you are actually getting feedback faster from your uh, test and it is extremely important to think about if visual testing is going to be an integral aspect of your automation journey of your automation strategy it may not be applicable in many cases but in many cases the brand reputation the revenue loss or uh, the uh, risk of losing your users because of the short attention span of your users right if something doesn't work well they'll go to some competitive product what is the risk to your product if any of this happens based on that you think about what are the risks you can take on and what are the risks that you need to mitigate for sure before the next release of your product goes out and including these as part of your strategy is going to be a very critical thing to uh, look at so here are some references uh, that uh, you can, uh, that i have spoken to or referred uh, to in uh, the slides and with this i'm going to stop talking so though we had some uh, hiccups i've managed to cover the content in time i rushed a little bit in between but uh, now we can get to the questions and um, we can have further conversations around that okay so please do put in your questions in the discuss panel and uh, we'll get to that uh, so let me start looking at the questions over here okay so the first question is uh, why can't functional tests cover visual testing issues there is a big limitation of what the functional testing can do from a visual perspective how are you going to check from your functional tests 
if there is an image that is loaded correctly or not, or if there is some overlapping content or not, right? So that is a big challenge from a functional testing perspective. And in some ways, maybe you can write a lot of code for uh, validating those types of issues, but you'll quickly run into issues when it comes to what about different viewport sizes, right? If I'm looking at a mobile web versus a laptop versus a 27 inch monitor, the layout is going to change because my product is responsive. So can I really do justice by writing how much code can I write to um, get that validation if it is even possible? So that is the first part. Uh, I hope that answers the questions actually. That was a few quick examples why functional testing cannot really uh, do visual testing to the level that is required. Also from aspects of color and everything, right? Uh, you need to think about that aspect as well. The next question is how to monitor KPIs across builds as part of CI CD pipelines, that is login time, time to check out, et cetera. Uh, again, a very interesting question, not tied to visual testing, but uh, I'll take a stab at answering that uh, uh, right now, is you need to have, you need to be able to capture metrics which are going to add value to you. So some of these KPIs that you're talking about, these are metrics, right? What are the metrics that are going to add value to you? And value is in terms of not to understand uh, just what your test execution has been, but really about what information does it give that can help you take decisions about your product quality or your test automation itself. So you need to look at, identify what are these metrics that are important to you. And then when you have identified these metrics, use the 80-20 rule and see how can you automate capturing of these metrics into dashboards or reports automatically as part of your test execution. So you don't have to spend time in capturing that data and taking decisions on those. So the 80-20 rule is extremely valuable over here to think about it, which, what can you do to get maximum value of uh, uh, automated results capture or uh, metrics capture based on what you'll be able to take decisions. And maybe the rest of 20% metrics for which you haven't been able to automate uh, getting the values directly. Is it okay if we live with just the 80% and uh, skip the 20%? Because do you have enough data in that 80% that will allow you to take decisions, right? So maybe uh, that is an approach I actually uh, take many a times. The next question is how localization testing can be done. Now localization testing itself is a very uh, different topic. And I will uh, add just one aspect uh, to this right now, right? Localization testing, it is very challenging for the team to do in terms of is this content correct? So I showed that example of the Facebook login screen, right? So if I just quickly uh, go back over there, so in the Facebook, so in this particular screen, I don't understand either of these languages. So does it mean that I cannot do any testing over here at all? So this is where your strategy again comes in, uh, which is very important about in which environment, what type of testing will I do? So maybe in my dev environment or in my QA environment where I have control over the data, for that fixed data, if I use a layout algorithm, the layout should not uh, break regardless of what data is fed into uh, these screens, right? When I'm comparing with, between different languages. However, if I want to check for a particular language itself, that's a different strategy. You can use a strict algorithm and say, I'm comparing a French login page with a French uh, language login page itself. And is there any difference when the data changes? Uh, I'll be able to capture that. So there are different aspects from a localization and automation perspective that you can think about. Uh, more in terms of automation for localization, we can talk about separately. The next question, uh, that are there first is a comment, I guess more is, I think all of these testings are still reactive until and unless people start working towards TDD, BDD. I do not think it makes sense with the legacy kind of automation testing. I would differ over there. You have to start somewhere. Not every project is going to start Greenfield or from scratch. You have to start somewhere. And how can you get the most value from your automation in that legacy product also? can be a big win as that legacy product evolves into new legacies uh, that it is creating, right? So even for existing products, 
you would start adding automation you would start uh, potentially adding visual testing if it makes sense in that context and then as that product evolves you will start uh, seeing the value of that the second aspect is even for legacy products uh, which had limited automation and you add more automation to it after the fact that becomes an opportunity for you to say i have a test safety net now can i do refactoring internally in the product and as long as my tests are still working fine maybe that is a good value or that these tests are also bringing to me so in fact that's a strategy that i have taken in multiple projects in my past experiences where for legacy products to enable certain change in the product functionality the big risk is it doesn't have any automation so first we build automation based on what we know about the product functionality to as much level of detail as possible and then using that as a safety net we start refactoring bits and pieces and make sure our tests continues to keep passing uh, as that refactoring is happening so hopefully that uh, helps uh, answer that particular comment itself thank you for joining us today and thank you everyone and again apologies for the technical glitch thanks everyone bye bye